This text is Losing My Cool by Thomas Chatterton Williams. Today we are reading pages 1 through 17, which is pages 49 to 58 in our text PDF. Chapter 1. Discoveries of what it means to be a black boy. It was winter time, early in the morning. I was in third grade standing on the rectangular assault playground behind Holy Trinity Inter Philosophical School in Westview, New Jersey. Palm in a tennis ball, waiting. Ned, nearsighted and infamous for licking the dusty soles of his penny loafers in the back of social studies class, was splayed against the cold orange brick wall of the school building. He had his head down and heads up, legs akimbo, but his butt out, like a South American mule bracing herself to be searched by Border Patrol. Not so hard, he cried, glancing back over his shoulder through smudged Coke bottle lenses. Put your head down, another boy yelled. Fine, just do it and get it over with then. Ned muttered, head down, the boy said. I would, my arm back and let fly a fastball that seemed to hang in the air for a second before ricocheting, ricocheting from the small of Ned's back like a Pete Scarnfus ace off some hapless ball boy at Wimbledon. Ned jerked upright and howled in pain. All my classmates screamed and high-fived me as the bell rang, and we rushed to grab our book bags and line up in the size order before our teachers came to lead us indoors. I was still the undisputed king of butt-ups. I thought to myself as I pulled my Chicago Bull starter jacket over my uniform, standing in line waiting for the younger grades to file past. I began mumbling to myself bits of a song by Public Enemy, a song that my older brother had been playing at home and that had got stuck in in my head that week, like the timetables of the Holy Rosary. Yo, nigga. Yo, nigga. Yo, nigga. I repeated the refrain over and over under my breath. Unthinkingly, as I relieved in my eyes, the glories cooled the grass, the death book. The death blow. I just dealt Ned from ten yards away. Blow. But you're a nigger too. A voice said from behind me, and I half made out what I just heard, but not fully. I went on singing my song, which I couldn't claim to understand on any level, but which somehow made me feel cool as hell. And that's what all that was all that mattered. The voice repeated itself louder this time. But you're a nigger, too, Thomas, aren't you? Huh? I said, pivoting to see Kirk standing there, his dirty blonde hair cut by his mother's flow be into the shape of an upside-down serving bowl, like a medieval frere without the bald spot. What did you just say? You're a nigger, too, right? So how can you say that? How can I say what? Yo, nigga, yo, nigga. How can you say that when you're a nigger, too, right? My mother is white, my father is black. They met in San Diego in the late teen, in the late nineteen sixteen the late nineteen sixties. Both were in stretch on the South Coast front of what time of what at the time was called War on Poverty. After San Diego, they went up to Las Vegas from LA. They made their way north and my father pursued doctoral studies in sociology at the University of Oregon. In 1975 and over my maternal grandfather's dead body, they were married in Eugene's at the country's courthouse. They had little money, fewer blessings and plenty of love. Later they moved again to Spokane and my mother Kathleen gave birth to the first child Clarence, named for my father. From Spokane, the family continually moved east, first to Denver, then to Albany, then to Philadelphia, and finally to New Jersey, where I was born in 1981. When I was one years old, my father switched professions and family moved again, this time from Newark, where he had been running anti-poverty programs for the Epicostal Archidoses, and my mother had been raising my brother and me to Fanwood, a small suburb 30 minutes to the west on U.S. Route 22. 
Fan wouldn't like the small, like the space inside a horseshoe is bordered on three sides by the much larger townships of Scotch Plains. And these two municipalities, by large, by and large functions, is one. They share a train station and public school systems, and together act as a kind of buffer ground between wealthy Westfields to the east and poor Plainfields to the west. Riots and waves of fights long ago left Plainfield a vex cross between a legitimate inner city ghetto. With all the risks, requisite crime, poverty, and hopelessness that go with the way. And an emergent middle class suburbs that in many ways resembles Westfields, except for the conditions of the houses and the colors of the residents. No such white flights occurred in Fanwood, Scotch Plains, or Westfield. Although, like so many small towns in New Jersey, they had designated black pockets. When my parents first began searching in the area, real estate brokers only wanted to show them homes in plain fields or on the red, red-lined black sides of town. They said families like ours tended to prefer things this way, but my father, whom we call Pappy and nod to his southern roots, had led a childhood that was boxed in by formal segregation in Texas and no longer could stand to be told where to live. Out of principle, he said to the brokers, thank you, but no thank you, and insisted on seeing things, seeing all his things. Reluctantly, they caved and the four of us settled in a three-bedroom ranch on a fan woods, decidedly white side. It was a neighborhood of well-kept homes with yards that were floated up with inflatables, it's a boy, lawn signs, lighted holiday displays, and occasional life-size Virgin Mary shrine. There were two main downtown areas in either direction of our house, with more pizzerias than banks or dry cleaners, and to Pappy and to Pappy's lament, without a single bookstore between them. Our neighbors were what my parents called ethnic whites, and they tended to grow up, buy homes, have children, and die within a 20-mile radius of where they were born. A fact that always seemed to strike mom and pappy as bizarre. As a family, we did not fit in with these people who often didn't know what to make of us. Once, when I was a very young boy, I was at the grocery store with my mother, misbehaving as little children do. When an older white woman walked by and said, Uh, it must be so tough adopting those kids from the ghetto. Despite my mother being white, we were black. We were a black and not an interracial family. Both of my parents stressed this distinction, and that, and the result was that growing up, race was not a complicated issue in our household. My brother and I were black, period. My parents adhered to a strict and unified philosophy of race, the contents of which boiled down to the following. There's no such thing as being half white for black. They explain is a less biological category than a social one. It is a condition of the mind that is loosely linked to certain physical features, but more than anything, it is a culture, a challenge, and a discipline. We were taught from the moment we could understand spoken words that we would be treated by whites as though we were blacks, whether we liked it or not. And so we needed to not know how to move in the world as black men. And that was that. Questions of the souls were less clear. My mother, protestant, the daughter of an evangelistic Baptist minister. My father is what he calls a geopolitical, existential, secularist, humanist, realist. Which really is just his way of saying he doesn't put many stocks in organized religion. Nevertheless, after very nearly being homeschooled, Clarence and I were enrolled in a private Catholic school for my father described as the superior levels of discipline. They offered in relation to the public schools nearby. Another factor in the decision was the day Clarence came home from school one. About a half block away from our front door, dazed and unable to speak. He was in the second grade, and my father had given me and him an ox blood leather briefcase. Apparently, this made him stand out among the other boys. 
So they did his sun tanned skin, which after that long hot summers was the color of the maple honey. And his hair, which was styled in a large spherical afro, in which his childhood was light brown with the strands of blonde and something like sherry in it. Beautiful. My mother and sometimes my father would comb my brother's afro in the morning with an orange tin can of Marais dressing grease and a black plastic pick. You look distinguished now, son, Pappy would say. And the smile when he finished with him, distinguished being the rarest and highest compliment in his vocabulary. Clarence was a quiet boy with thick hair, good muscle tone, and intelligent almond-shaped eyes, but neat bushy down eyebrows. The day at school, a group of white children had concern and taunted him in the yard, asking what a fucking monkey to do with the briefcase. Either the one black student didn't see the ha- see this happen, or they chose not to intervene. Pappy yanked Clarence from public school the next day. By the time I was old enough, being in class with our neighbors wasn't even an option. Unlike some children of mixed race heritage, I didn't ever wish to be white. I wanted to be black. One of the first adult books my parents gave to me around age seven was Alex Haley's The Autobiography of Malcolm X. Often, my mother would come into my room in the evening and discuss with me what I was reading. For several nights, I lay awake long after she turned on the lights, haunted by the image of Malcolm's father lying prone on the railroad tracks. His body torn into two and his cranium cracked open like a coconut husky. I didn't want to resemble in any way whatsoever those men who didn't like that to other men. Who did things like that to other men. It was a fortunate thing for me, too, that I didn't want to be white. It was fortunate because I really didn't have much choice in the matter. My parents are right. Around white kids, I was simply not white. Whatever fantasies of passing may have threatened to steal into the mulatto psych and wreck havoc, they were dispelled early on. When Tina turned around in her chair, flipped her bronze ponytail to the side and asked me point blank and audibly enough for the whole class to hear, hey, why doesn't your hair move like everyone else? It's because I'm black, I told her, and I wasn't angry or embarrassed. It was just a fact. I felt that way she was husky or big boned. Though we didn't speak about it outright, I don't think my brother Clarence ever wanted to be white either. He just didn't seem to see race everywhere around him like my parents and I did. Or if he saw it, he fled from it. And he didn't want to analyze it or have something or have to spend his time unraveling it. He didn't want to be forced to make a big deal out of it. He was forgiving and trusting and found companions wherever they would be. His two best friends were black and he dated a quiet Asian girl for a spell during high school. Mostly, though, he fell in with a set of neighborhood white boys with lots of vows and in their surname and little in their head. These white boys were almost certainly the same ones whose years earlier had remained my brother with racial epithets on the school one playground. But Clarence never knew to hold a grudge, and this was ages ago. And these were his neighborhoods, and they liked to do things like that he liked to do. Ride bikes, ride skateboards, talk cars, smoke cigarettes, cut class, hang out. And they did take him in as one of their own. That's true. Although, I could see even as a child that they, they did so without even fully allowing him to rest his mind. To forget that he was black, and he was somehow other. Still, I can't fault my brother for going the way he felt was most comfortable. He was a child of the late 70s and 80s. Hip-hop hadn't completely circumscribed the whole world he was formed in. I was a child of the late 80s and 90s, on the other hand. I went the other route. Not that it was always an easy route to go. It was not enough simply to know and accept that you were black. You had to look and act that way, too. You were going to be judged by how conventionally you could pull off the pose. One day, when I was around nine years old, my mother drove 
Clarence and me to the unisex hair creations, a black barber shop in a working class section of Plainfield. Back then, we had a metallic blue used Mercedes sedan, which from the outside seemed in good condition. Through underneath the hood, it was anything but. As the countless repair bills, Pappy jugged wood assessed, while the three of us waited for the light to change colors i became transfixed by the jittery figures of a long thin black woman in a stained t-shirt and a sweatpants a greasy scarf wrapped around her head she was holding an incons- unconcealable baby in one hand and puffing a long cigarette with the other stalking the second floor balcony of a beat-up old victorian mansion that had been converted into apartments I must have really been staring at her because all of a sudden I noticed that she was, wasn't was aimlessly placing back and forth anymore, or pointing and yelling specifically at their car. What the fuck are you staring at? She howled. You rich white motherfuckers in your Mercedes. Go the fuck home. You think you can come here and watch us like you're in a goddamn zoo? She was making a scene. Passerby and the street were taking notice and looking at our car. This was a time where Benzes were the shit, and you had to be careful where you parked because tough guys would put pull, would pull off the little hood ornaments and wear it from a chain around their neck. I was terribly uncomfortable being the center of attention there in that black seat, mentally pleading for the light to turn green. I was also confused as hell. Who were these white people this woman kept referring to? Was she talking about us? Was she talking about me? Of course, my mother was white, but I didn't understand how she could think I was white too. After all, I was on the way that very moment to have my hair cut at the only barbershop in the area that would cut hair like mine's. Curly, nappy hair. The kind that didn't move. The kind of hair that disqualified me from getting cuts as a white barbershop two blocks away from my house. But this woman was talking to me. Just ignore her, my mother said, and finally we drove away. But I couldn't drive that woman's angry face out of my head. She had somehow stripped me of myself, taken something from me. I felt I had to protect myself from everything that kind of lost again. When I stepped into the barbershop that day, and every second every second Saturday after, I was extra careful to pay attention to the other black boys sitting inside. Some with their uncles, some with their fathers and brothers, some sitting all alone. These boys became like models to me. I studied their postures and their screw faces, their unlaced purple and turquoise felines on their feet, their mannerisms, the way they slap hands in the street, these boys were never singled out and dissed the way I had been. I decided I wanted whatever it was that protected them. Inside unisex, it smelled deliciously of witch hazels and barbasol, and there were three long rows of cushion seats facing five Shreveville barbers, chains, chairs like bleachers in a gymnasium. There was an old fake wood paneled colored te- television suspended from the ceiling in the far black corner. If a bootlegged movie wasn't playing on the BCR, the TV stayed stuck on one channel in particular the rest of the time. A channel I soon learned was called Black Entertainment Television, BET. At the time in the mornings when I usually came into the shop, the program Rhapsody would be showing these barbershops Rhapsody sessions were not my first exposure to hip-hop and culture. Of course, I have been aware of it vaguely through the tapes my brother brought home and played in his bedroom. I don't believe, I don't believe, though, that I ever noticed BETs before. And in the strange, homogeneously black settings of unisex hair creations and the city of Plainfield beyond it, the sight of this all-black cable station mesmerized me. Watching BET felt cheap and even a little wrong on an intuitive level. My parents would admire most of what was shown. Poppy called it ministerly, but the men and women in the videos just didn't just didn't just contend for my attention. 
They demanded it, and I obliged them. They were all luridly sexy, sexual, so gua- so guadilly decked out, so physically confident, with the oh I wish a nigga would air of defiance, so defi- so defensively assertive. I could pry my eyes away. One mo- morning, Ice T's new Jack Hustlers video came on, and though I didn't know what the meaning behind the title or even whether I liked what I was hearing, I knew for sure that the other boys in the shop didn't seem to question any of it, and I sensed that I shouldn't either. All of them knew the words to the song, and some rapped along it convincingly. I paid attention to the slang and they were using, and I decided I had to learn it myself. Terms like nigga and bitch were embedded in my thought process, and I was consciously aware for the first time that it wasn't enough just to know lexicon. There was also a certain way of moving and gesticulating that went with whatever was being said. A silent body language that everyone seemed to speak and understand, whether rapping or chatting, which I would need to get down to. Over the weeks and months that followed, as I became more and more adept at mimicking and projecting blackness, the BET way, and while it was still fresh to me, what stuck me most about this new behavior was how far it varied not just from the from that of my white classmates and friends at Hollywood Holy Trinity, but also from the father and two older black barbers in the barbershop. Sharp men who looked out of the place in the unisex and who held the door and brushed parts of the sides of their head. One afternoon, I came home from the barbershop sporting an aerodynamic new hair creation of my own. What on earth did you let them do to you, son? Poppy said as soon as she saw me. Our house was not spacious. The front door directly there. The front door opened directly in Pappy's studies, which he had converted from what ordinarily would have been a living room. To enter the house was literally to step into his scrutinizing gaze. Huh? I said, touching my hand to my head. The top was so flat and cylindrical, it resembled an unused number two pencil, a razor. The sides and the back were shaved all the way down, revealing a shaft of high yellow scalp. What did, what, did they, didn't listen what you told them that you wanted? No, they did. I said, this is what I wanted. You wanted that? Well, yeah. It's what everybody is wearing. Babe, it's what's on BETs. And you look, and you want to look like everyone else, son. Is that what you want? He was staring at me intently now. I stood there before him, studying the air flights on my feet. I didn't have a response he would find remotely respectable. The thing is that I did want to look like everyone else. Everyone else in the barbershop and on that TV screen. After all, even in the backseat of a big old Mercedes, the woman on the balcony would never mistake a brother with a flat top like this for being white. Annoyed or dismayed by new coif as he was, Though Pappy allowed Clarence and me generous amount of latitude with, when it came to our personal sound, as long as we were giving him our best effort is what he cared about most, development of our minds. What this meant giving him our best, what this meant giving him our best, was not that we were pressured to place in our place first in our classes or even get straight A's on our schoolwork, although it would have been welcomed if we did. We were expected to maintain decent grades, but it was deeper than that. Poppy no longer worked working as a psychologist, sociolo- sociologist now, but put his PhD at an expensive store of personal knowledge and reading to use running a private academic and SAT preparation service from our home. From the second grade on, giving Poppy our best meant we needed to try hard in school, but most importantly, that we needed to study one-on-one with him in the evenings and on weekends, on long vacations, and all throughout the summer breaks. If he could not do that, he was able to make our home the most uncomfortable inn to lodge in. When Clarence began blowing off work, he didn't just get grounded. 
He came home to find his bedroom all stripped bare. His Michael Jordan and Rum DMC posters replaced with pastel sheets of algebra equations Poppy had printed and tacked up. As for me, the first time Pappy called me into his studies to explain my summer schedule, I was seven and my eyes betrayed me, welling with tears against my will. When he looked up from his notes and saw this, he got so offended that he stormed out of the room and I fell into my mother's lap crying. I did not want to do the work he planned for me. I wanted to play with my friends and have sleepover parties. I wanted to capture fireflies in the ventilated smucker jars and beat the Super Mario Brothers on Clarence and Nintendo. That was the truth. However, more than anything, I wanted not to disappoint my father. With my mother's encouragement and some Kleenex, I followed Poppy into his bedroom and told him that I was just... I just had something in my eye and that, in fact, I had not been crying. I was eager to start some studying. I told him... He suspended his disbelief and led me back in his desk, where he proceeded to lay out an intensive program of legitimate reg- work in sciologist, sciologistics, and sparsal reasoning, vocabulary building, Miller analogies, arith- arithmetic, and reading comprehensions. His signature cocktail. If Poppy was a tyrant, he was a gentle and conflicted one who did not relish the role. He yearned for a time where he could cease having to be one at all. What he hoped was that if he could somehow just make reading and studying appealing enough to his boys, eventually we wouldn't need his prodding anymore and we'd simply do it on our own. To that end, he made sure not to dangle punishments over our head. Sword of Damocle styles and leave it all, leave it at that. He went out of his way to be fair. If we just did what he asked without too much complaint, he would do us something real solid in return, such as paying us generally for our time. Studying studying is your job, and an honest day of work deserves an honest day of pay. Intervening on our behalf with our when our mother doled out chores, studying is their only job. And tolerating a slew of hair clothing and dating choices that were in flagrant violation of his personal taste. Despite these en- enticements, Clarence would always find it difficult to to take long periods of study, and he went through fits of resistance routinely. Being the younger brother, I had advantage of learning from his mistakes and avoiding most of his battles. I was what Poppy called a dutiful son. Most of the time, this dutifulness of mine sufficed. sufficed. We were really in open conflict with each other, and he almost always patient and playfully encouraging me. Encouraging with me. Thomas Chatteron, he'd say, addressing me by my middle name as I sped through his studies on my way to the kitchen, obliviously to my surroundings. Do you know, do you know you wear the name of a brilliant poet, son? He'd call me from the other room. Yeah, of course, babe. I think I'd say, poking my head into the refrigerator, looking for something sweet. And do you know they call him Marvelous Boy? His poetry was so fine, he said. Still talking to the, talking to me from the other room. Uh-huh. I say with my mouth full. Well, they do. His poetry was so fine. In fact, he was so young when he wrote it that the adults couldn't even believe the work was his own. They all accused him of copying someone else so much older. They did? They sure did. And do you know they became so distraught by this? He became so discouraged that he killed himself when he was only 17 years old. He decided he couldn't live with the dishonor. That's horrible. Yes, it is, son. Life is not fair. But now you're going to be able to bring honor to his name, aren't you? It's very important that you do that, son. But I don't know how to, babe. I'd say returning to the study with a bowl of ice cream and a glass of soda in my hands. Well, you don't have to be a poet, son. You can be a great philosopher. For example, pull up a seat. A philosopher, I say, and sit down? Yes, in fact, a philosopher already, aren't you? I don't think so, I'd say, my cheeks flushing. Well, yes, you are, son. Think about it. Do you question the things around you? Do you reflect on their meaning and their interested truth? 
interested in the truth? Yeah. Then you're a philosopher, son, he would tell me. And I would laugh, embarrassed, because I didn't feel I like a philosopher. Whatever that was, I could only imagine. I felt ignorant, which is what confessed him. And he would tell me that ignorance is the beginning of knowledge and talk of men named Socrates and Confucius. He revered these two men, perhaps above all other men. Socrates for his ethic to know thyself and Confucian for his devotion to learning and personal excellence. He said, I would sit there at Poppy's desk, exhausting whatever sugary collection I had brought with me I had brought with me from the kitchen and listen to him talk. Well I've told you enough. He'd eventually say, Now you tell me how I am I growing to grow up and be small like you. We'd laugh and I'd try to come up with some reply. These questioning talks I'd had with Poppy were so freaking in my childhood that to this day, the name Socrates remains mingled in my mind with the image of a balding and bearded father seated in his study. I cannot think of one without inadvertently conjuring the other. Sometimes, though, Poppy grew impatient waiting for the love of learning to take root in me. I don't understand, he'd say in mourning in moments of frustration. How you can keep walking past all these books and never stop to pick up a single one of them. My people told me not to read. Don't you know what I would have done to have all this? Don't you ever get curious, son. These were simple, honest questions that, some, that sometimes he put to me with a shake of the head and a very smile. Sometimes, though, he didn't smile at all. In these later moments... The look on his face was nothing like anger and something like pain. A sort of deep, serious pain I have only replicated in pictures of black faces of a certain age and demographic. It was pain that I knew I couldn't have caused, but somehow I must have mistakenly activated. I would stand there, looking at him, frozen like a deer suspended in hollow gun beams, and stammers and weak response. That particularly that particular afternoon, after my visit to the barbershop, Pappy let drop the subject of my rectangular head of hair and handled handed me my work for the day. There was no long talk and no sadness in his face after that afternoon. Memories, exercises, and vo- then vocabularies, both synonyms and antonyms, he said. Write them all on a flashcard and then come see me. Okay, babe. I said, and went to my room, carrying a pale green telescope, a stack of SAT and GRE word lists, and a thick Merriam-Webster Collegate Dictionary, glad to have dodged the confrontation. After a morning spent at the barbershop, submerged in black entertainment television, speaking and thinking in my forward second son, Ebonics, it was time now to return to the stand, stead, and fam- familiar language of my father. Thank you for reading.